All right, it's about 105, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Jeremy Gordon. I'm a senior engineer in the Department of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging. Um, and my work focuses uh, primarily on hyperpolarized carbon imaging, um, predominantly the translation of this technique to, to clinical applications. Uh, today, it'll be my first of two lectures, uh, and I'll be focusing on polarization physics and then the uh, polarizer hardware needed to run these experiments. Um, the first hour of this will be the lecture, and the second will be a, a hands on um, demo with the, the hypersensor preclinical polarizers. Um, as we go along, I urge you to ask questions and have it be back and forth, so feel free to interrupt as, as we, we go along. So today I'll be talking a little bit about DNP, or dynamic nuclear polarization, and the underlying physics behind it. Second half of this talk will be focused on the, uh, the preclinical and the clinical polarizer hardware that we have in both the high field and the Cerbeck labs. And then um, my next lecture will be focusing on imaging approaches. How do we take this increase in, in polarization and signal and how do we use it um, rapidly and efficiently to encode our images? That will be for, for the future, right? So thinking about just MRI in general, um, in the absence of, of a magnetic field, the spins in a sense no, ha have no, no preferred orientation therefore no net magnetization. Um, but if we think of the spins in terms of bulk magnetization, um, you know, what happens when they're placed into a, into a magnetic field? What, a, what occurs for, for spin half nuclei, right? So we have this concept of, of Zeeman splitting. We have two different energy states for spin one half nuclei. Um, and they also process around the, the main magnetic field with the Larmor frequency given by the gamma or gyromagnetic ratio, and the B0 of the field strength. Um, also, these notes in P will be online in, in PDF version, so they'll all be there. So don't need, don't, you don't need to worry too much about writing what's on here. Uh, that'll be available later. So we know that we put these spin one half nuclei or anything with a net magnetic, uh, magnetic moment into a high field system, and we have this sort of idea of polarization or bulk magnetization, right? So if that's the case, why do we need to have a, a strong magnet, an MRI? Like why can't we just, you know, use 0.5 Gauss Earth's magnetic field to do this? Any thoughts? Yeah, so it comes down to the fact that while you might have uh, a bulk magnetization, even if very low field, your thermal noise exactly leads to very low, low sensitivity because of Boltzmann equilibrium. And so the idea here is that the relative ratio of spins in sort of the low versus high energy state is given by this exponent here, which can then be written in terms of a fraction of polarization between zero and one. Um, it's dependent on essentially the, the field strength, so the energy separation between those two, Z, two uh, Zeeman spin states, and then the temperature of that, that sample, so sort of the, the thermal energy of, of the system. So going to a higher field gives us a bigger energy, energy separation between those states, and it gives us a higher polarization, or that difference in spin states that we can use for our MR experiments. So, you know, SNR and MRI, if you go back down to the, the very basic NMR type equation, can be overly complicated. It's a function of your flip angle and it's a function of your coil design and T2 star and temperature and all sorts of factors. But for the purposes of, of what we'll talk about here, the SNR is proportional to N, sort of the number of spins in your sample, gamma, that gyromagnetic ratio or the, the frequency they, they, they resonate at, and then this, this thermal polarization. Right, and so when you look at it, you know, at, at clinical strengths and physiologic temperature, our thermal polarization is, is very, very small. I'm talking about, you know, two to, to nine parts per million, which is why MR is oftentimes referred to as a relatively insensitive technique. Um, but that said, though, we do MRI quite routinely, you know, clinical strengths, one and a half, 18, even lower. And we can do that because 
water and fat have very high in vivo concentrations, around 110 molar for water and a little bit less for fat. And that helps to offset the low, um, low polarization and inherently low sensitivity of MR as a technique. However, other nuclei that, that have um, non-zero spin, such as carbon and phosphorus, are important because they can inform directly about, about biochemistry and biochemical pathways in a way that might be difficult to infer from just the water and, and fat signal. However, they have inherently poor SNR due to lower concentration and lower gyromagnetic ratios. In particular, carbon would be um, very advantageous to look at directly. It's the backbone of life and plays a central role in, or in organic chemistry and biochemistry. But C12, the main isotope of carbon, um, has no NMR signal, and C13, which has been one half, is only present at 1.1%. So in terms of relative sensitivity of endogenous compounds, the, the C13 is, is it's an uphill battle to, to get C13 from a signal <laughs> from endogenous substrates. So you're looking at relative sensitivities three to four orders of magnitude lower than that of, of water. So going back to this idea of, of thermal polarization, right? we know that's a function of gamma, the nucleus you're looking at, it's a function of B0, your operating field strength, and it's a function of your temperature. So thinking of it in terms of your polarization, what, what, what are some things that we could do to increase that polarization? What are the, the free variables that we have control over? As in what's a constant and what's not in that equation? Yeah, so, right, so, so gamma is, it's, it's nucleus dependent, so thinking of it classically, if you want to look at proton or carbon, that's fixed. So your two free variables are field and temperature, right, and so you're saying you can increase your, your field strength, you increase the energy separation between those states, you also can decrease your temperature, lower that, that sort of Boltzmann or thermal noise. Um, so you have an upper limit as to what you can do for, for field strength, you know, 30 or 50 Tesla is kind of as high as you can get to realistically. Um, so that gives you maybe a, a 10 or 15 fold increase in signal or signal noise over 3T. So it helps, but it's certainly not enough to overcome the, the low sensitivity of these non-proton non nuclei. Um, you also can, can decrease temperature. That, that's one way to do it. And looking back at a plot like here, we have polarization plotted as a function of temperature for um, both carbon nuclei, proton nuclei, and then electrons, which are also have a magnetic moment for spin one half. And so you can see if you want to get to, you know, very high levels of polarization, 20, 30, 40 percent, it's certainly possible by lowering the temperature, but you need to get to vanishingly small temperatures in order to do so. You know, for instance, for carbon, you have to get down to um, millikelvin range, which, uh, as we'll talk about, it is is possible but impractical for for a few reasons. So, one way to do this is simply just to lower that temperature, get it to the millikelvin range, and you can get 60, 70, 80 percent polarization, and get you more than five orders of magnitude increase in your in your signal to noise. Um, so the pros here is it's straightforward, right? You have your sample. You don't need to really do anything to it except make it very, very, very cold. And then wait some time and you have your polarization. Um, but there are a number of, of significant downsides to this. One is it's not trivial to get down to these temperatures. You need special hardware. And even then it's very time consuming and expensive to get down to that millikelvin type temperature. More importantly, if you have so-called long buildup times, right? So here, once you put your sample into any magnetic field at any given temperature, it takes some time for it to sort of build up that magnetization, right? It's essentially T1 recovery in this, in, this, in this state. The problem you have is that when you get to these very low temperatures at modest or even high magnetic fields, these buildup times become uh, quite long. And so here you're looking at buildup time as a function of, of or the, the, the signal or polarization as a function of time. You notice the x-axis down here is in not seconds or minutes, but hours. So what that means is you've got buildup times on the order of 
13 to 60 hours, that's effectively your T1. You want to have five of those T1s before you have your, your max, like max polarization. So your throughput is um, rather rate limiting here if it takes 60 to 100 hours to build up. So you're not going to get many experiments done in this type of time scale. That's an uphill battle. So where does that leave us? Well, if you look at this blue line here, um, you notice that it has a much higher polarization and a much larger temperature. And this is because the, the electron, you might not think about it, but it's also spin one half. It has a magnetic moment. Uh, and the thing here is that it's, it's magnetic ratio is roughly 660 times larger than that of proton and even fourfold higher than that of carbon which means that it has a larger energy separation at a given field strength and temperature. So what that means is that at more modest temperatures here in this, you know, one to two Kelvin range, which we can get to relatively easily with liquid helium and a vacuum pump, we have some spins that are almost 100% polarized. That is, they're all aligned parallel to the main magnetic field. And so the concept of, of DNP or dynamic nuclear polarization is we are designing or using sort of spin physics to transfer the polarization from the electron, which is almost 100% polarized at the operating field strength and temperature to the carbon nucleus. And in so doing, give us a uh, significant increase in, in polarization in a relatively short amount of time. So for most of the, the polarization studies, this, this approach yields 20 plus percent polarization in only um, one to two hours. And what this means is we have essentially a five orders of magnitude enhancement to our, to our signal. The signal enhancement is essentially compensates for the lower sensitivity and lower concentration and allows us to do our sort of non-invasive real-time metabolic imaging experiments with, with carbon-13 substrates. So what that means in practice is we have, in this case, this is a hyperpolarized urea sample. So a small amount of urea goes went into a hypersense polarizer, was built up for an hour, was dissoluted. And this is the result of a single spectrum scan. So 90 degree tip angle, one FID, here's your result. Comparatively, if you then put that that sample into a, a magnet at 9.4 Tesla at the so-called Boltzmann equilibrium. This is, the, this is the type of results you get after 65 hours of averaging at the Ernst angle. And so you can see you get a dramatic increase in signal to noise, which gives you a sort of a dramatic reduction in, in your scan time. So you can use this magnetization to now do experiments that you would need to average for inordinately long times to be able to get useful data. So I'm gonna walk through a little bit about the, the DNP requirements and the solid state physics. Um, this is gonna to, meant to be very much like an introduction and, and high level concept idea of how DNP works. Um, there are multiple different DNP pathways that, that we'll talk about. Um, at the end of the slides, I have some, some I guess, suggested or further reading that you can look into if you kind of want to go down that, that rabbit hole in terms of trying to optimize your polarization and improve it. This is going to be just kind of an introduction here. So in basic terms, right, the goal of DMP is to transfer the polarization from that unpaired electron to your nucleus of interest. For us, that's typically carbon. And so we have some requirements that have to be met, right? Certainly we need to be at low temperature and high field. That's so that we have the electrons at essentially 100% or so polarization. Um, we need a free radical or unpaired electron, which allows us to transfer that polarization. Typically, we have roughly a 1 to 1,000 ratio here. So if we have 15 molar pyruvate, we'll have around 15 millimolar or 1,000 fold less of radical. So in other words, one of those unpaired electrons can have an outsized effect. So one electron can impact many nuclei. And then other things, we need to form a, a neat class, a so-called neat class. These samples 
can't crystallize. Um, you don't want to have any crystal formation, and it does impair the the um, DMP process. And that's something Dave will talk a bit more about when he talks about the, the sample prep. So something to keep in mind there. And also, we need a microwave source, which is what drives that polarization, the transfer from the electrons to the, the nuclei of interest. So there are three main mechanisms for dynamic nuclear polarization, the so-called solid effect, cross effect, and thermal mixing. So if anything, at the end of the day, I just want you to come away with the fact that you know, DMP is kind of an umbrella term, and there are different um, quantum mechanical processes or phenomenon that lead to this sort of polarization enhancement. Um, the solid effect to me is kind of conceptually the, the, the simplest to understand. Um, you're, you're transferring the polarization from the electrons to the nuclei by driving this forbidden transition, um, which are seen in, in, in red here. So what you do is you apply your microwaves at um, essentially the Larmor frequency of the electron plus or minus Larmor frequency of, of the nucleus. So what you're doing here is this, this flip-flop transition. So you have essentially a electron in, let's say, spin up and polarization in a carbon nucleus and spin down. You apply this microwave radiation as energy into the system to drive a transition. And now you essentially push one of your carbon nuclei to spin down and you flop the electron. And the key here is that the electron T1 is much shorter than that of the nuclear T1, which is why you need a much smaller concentration. So essentially you do this, the electron relaxes back down to its so-called thermal equilibrium within about a second or so, and it can then be used to, to service and, and transfer the polarization again. So the key here is you need the electronic T1 to be much shorter than that of the nuclear T1. This solid effect typically dominates at low field, and low what's called EPA or paramagnetic aging concentration. It's not the, the dominant source that we see at the um, hypersense and the spin lab um, field strengths, but it is one of the, the three main mechanisms that we can use to transfer polarization. Um, the cross effect as we go down the road here gets a little more complicated. It's a three spin system, so you have two electrons and one nuclear spin. Um, here the requirements are a little more uh, specific. Now you need to have essentially the Larmor frequency difference between two electrons be roughly equal to uh, the nuclear Larmor frequency, along with certain things in terms of like line width for your EPR spectrum or how broad that EPR electron line is to be broader, broader than your nuclear Larmor frequency. So again, here it's not as easy to, to conceptually understand. What we're doing is we apply microwave radiation at one of these electron resonances. This leads to this three spin interaction, which transfers the polarization from the electron to the nucleus, in our case, carbon. So the end goal is the end result's the same. We transfer the polarization from the electron to the nucleus, the electron relaxes, and this time scale, the, the, the carbon nucleus doesn't. And so we can recycle and use those electrons many times to transfer the polarization to many carbon nuclei. This is more or less the dominant effect that we see at our uh, at high field and low concentration. It's where we typically reside. So for the hypersense and for the spin lab, we predominantly have um, cross effect mediated uh, polarization. Um, thermal mixing is an extension of this. Um, here the, the sort of underlying spin physics are still being worked out. So I don't pretend to to know all the details in terms of thermal mixing, but it's an extension of the cross effect. Now you have an interaction between many electrons and a single nucleus. And so it's oftentimes thought of in terms of these electronic spin systems and different sort of Zeeman baths with, with, with different temperature. So the idea is you put these, you apply the microwaves near that electron resonance, and it puts these two spin systems in contact between the electron spin system and nuclear spin system and it leads to what's called dynamic cooling of the nuclear spins. And because they're sort of dynamically cooling, you can think of it as increasing the, the nuclear polarization. Um, here, it, it does require less microwave power than the solid effect, so it is more efficient. And it's also dominant at this medium to high field. So 
when we do our experiments, we, we typically have sort of cross effect and thermal mixing dominated uh, polarization. That's our transfer mechanism. So one thing to, to be aware of too is that if you look at this, this plot here, sort of the DMP process is, is efficient when you're transferring the electron from the electrons to sort of these nearby nuclei in, in blue. But you need to have dipole-dipole coupling or dipolar coupling, I should say, between the uh, electrons and the carbon nuclei to have trans uh, efficient transfer of polarization. So to reach these other carbon nuclei that are further away, you, you have to undergo what's called um, spin diffusion, which then transfers that polarization to sort of remote or, or nuclei further away that aren't directly coupled to those unpaired electrons. And so again, here you have some, some trade-offs to make and that need to have enough spins in your sample to, to allow spin diffusion. So when you have a very dilute sample you're polarizing, it's hard to get efficient and high polarization. Um, on the other end, you, you, you do have kind of an upper limit as to how concentrated you can make your sample. If you, if you get it to be too high, you can have intermolecular dipolar effects, which shorten your nuclear T1 and shorten your overall polarization. So, you know, if you're working on things like compound development, it, it's one thing to, to be aware of that you can't have samples that are too dilute and that increasing your sort of solid state concentration doesn't always lead to higher solid state polarization. So this idea of, of, of DMPs, we talked a little bit roughly about, you know, the idea of transferring polarization from the electrons to your, your nuclei of interest. Um, we kind of talk about it as an instantaneous process, but this is definitely a process that, that takes time to occur. So it's essentially building up once we turn those microwaves on. And so what we have essentially is a um, signal that's changing, increasing through time, and it's really analogous to, to T1 recovery, where your, your polarization or your magnetization at time T is a function of how long you've been building up for and a function of this characteristic, it's called tau, or your, your, your buildup time. And so just like for T1 recovery, you want to wait at least three times that buildup time to achieve essentially 95% of your attainable polarization. So in the case of pyruvate, your buildup time is roughly 15 to, to 20 minutes at the hypersense temperature and hypersense field. So you'd want to wait around 45 or 60 minutes to build up your, your sample to max polarization. Um, so it's typically longer for, for other substrates where it's not as efficient and it does change when you go to different temperatures and different fields. So something you want to, to kind of characterize and measure when you do your experiments. So if we've talked about, you know, we have a number of competing effects that can determine um, sort of our rate of buildup and how we do the, the DMP process. So how do we possibly go about determining which microwave frequency to use? You know, what, if you think about it, classically the solid effect requires one microwave frequency, the cause effect wants a different one. How do you know which one is the, the best one to use? What could you do? Right. Well, what you can do essentially is what's called running a, a microwave sweep. And so as the name implies, you essentially have your, you, you sweep that microwave frequency over a um, relatively narrow range. So here it's around uh, 200 megahertz or so. And so you build up for a short amount of time at that frequency, you measure the solid state buildup, and then you repeat and sort of loop through or scan through these range of frequencies. And so you can see you get positive and negative enhancement and then where you, that sort of frequency that you have, the maximum enhancement is the one that you would then use for your, your experiments. And so this is something that's useful to do when you're developing new probes or even using a new system because even if you think about the hypersense act being at 3.35T, there is sort of some slight magnetic field drift between the systems. Uh, the microwave frequency generators can be um, a bit different between them. And so um, it's always good to, to know that optimal frequency on both systems, even if you know it on one. 
but also it's important if you're doing a different radical or just for a routine check. These things do drift over time. And so if you start to notice that you have lower polarization, running a microwave speed is probably the, one of the first things you wanna to do to make sure that that's um, you're still polarizing at the, the optimal frequency there. Yeah, so it's, all, it's, a, it's kind of a trade-off, right? Like the, the larger your window, the more time it will take. So typically what I would probably do is focus on that area of, of positive enhancement. And so, you know, from if you already have a probe or you already know what that frequency should be, I would kind of do maybe a, a, a narrower kind of frequency range just to kind of dial that in. But if you're developing a new probe or a new system, it's completely uncharacterized, I would make it a bit wider, let it go for a few hours and then come back. So it, that's, so this is a function of the, the field strength of the polarizer. So for a, a 3.35T hypersense, which is where we kind of operate, mostly based on what the, the microwave sources that we can get, that's kind of where you're going to be, 93.9, 94 gigahertz. Those are, that's typically the, the, the range you'll be operating at. Well, because that's the, that's the, the Larmor frequency of the electron. Right, so it's, it's, it's predominantly driven by the, the Larmor electronic frequency, right? Um, you do have a bit of shift in there that's dependent on the solid effect versus cross effect, but it's primarily driven by, yeah, the um, electronic Larmor frequency, which is why if you were to go to the spin lab, you'd be operating at 140 gigahertz and not 94. So like we've kind of alluded to, you know, polarizers are, are a kind of a catch-all term and they operate at, at different field strengths and in different temperatures. So the hypersense is typically 3.35T uh, at an operating temperature of 1.4, 1.35. Um, these spin lab systems, which are designed for, for clinical use, operate typically at higher fields, so 5 Tesla and lower temperature 0.8K. And other um, sort of hand-built polarizers that you'll come across in other labs and literature go to even higher temperatures. Right? So in, in general, um, increasing the operating field of the polarizer and decreasing the temperature lead to, to higher polarization. So here we can see that we increase the, the magnetic field, we get an increase in temperature and same, or sorry, increase in, in polarization as we decrease the temperature, we also get an increase in polarization. So taking a step back and thinking about this kind of conceptually, if at three Tesla and 1.4K, we already have 100% polarization for our electrons, why does further increasing the field or further decreasing the temperature make a difference to our nuclear polarization? Any thoughts? Helps the transfer. When you say it helps the transfer, what do you? Uh... Because it's not the polarization of the electron that matters, it's the polarization of the carbon. Right, so going to higher field and going to lower temperature has effectively a negligible impact on your electron polarization, right? So it's having an impact more on the nuclear polarization or the nuclear, let's say, relaxation pathways, right? And so it comes down to this interplay between your electronic T1 and your nuclear T1. And so your, your max polarization um, is essentially, it can be kind of written as a first order approximation as this equation here, which is a function of your electronic and nuclear T1s, and then this sort of leakage factor F, which comprises nuclear relaxation. Um, but you can just kind of think about it conceptually. So here you're, you're trying to essentially fill up a bucket with a hole in it. It's a very crude analogy, but one that I always come back to, right? So when your electronic T1 is, is very long, that sort of flow into the bucket is, is very slow. So you're not able to really transfer that polarization efficiently and you, you don't really have much, if any, increase in nuclear polarization. When they're about equal to each other, you can essentially pour a lot into the bucket or you can transfer a lot of polarization, but it decays 
very, very quickly. So you're not able to actually get any increase over time. Um, the, the best way to do it is to think of having a short electron T1 and a long nuclear T1. So we're able to, to pour into that, that bucket very quickly. And then this sort of decay rate, decay path is, is very slow. So that's why changing the field strength and changing the temperature has an impact on polarization. Higher field and lower temperature tends to lead to longer nuclear T1 times. So it makes this sink sort of smaller or the, the rate of decay slower. It doesn't, have, that, so it must not affect the T1 the electron as much. Yeah, so it, it does have an effect on both, but it's an outsized effect on your nuclear T1. So looking at the, the nuclear T1 here in the case of carbon, you know, as you go to, to higher field strengths, your, your T1s become significantly longer. It's almost uh, goes roughly as the, the field strength squared here. And that's why going to higher field gives you more solid state polarization. Um, the other way around it too is you can try and preferentially decrease your electronic T1 time, right? The shorter that is, the faster it can relax then sort of transfer the polarization again. That's why oftentimes when you use samples at the hypersense field, you'll have your pyruvate that, that commonly is, is doped or has a small amount of gadolinium or other paramagnetic lanthanides in there. And that's because prior research has shown that those sort of paramagnetic compounds at low temperature and at high field preferentially reduce that electronic T1 time. So that's why if you get your pyruvate sample from the freezer upstairs and you kind of look at what's actually on there, you'll see it has pyruvate, it has that free radical, the trital radical so-called, and it has a small amount of, of gadolinium in there, and that's for electronic T1 shortening. So one thing I do want to highlight here is that sample temperature is really important to, to maximize polarization. You know, field strength is that's kind of what you get when you, when you buy and operate a polarizer, but you do have some, some flexibility and some range into what your temperature can be. Um, this is kind of hard to see. It'll be easier to see on, on a PDF when you can zoom in, but as a rule of thumb, you get roughly a 10% change in your achievable polarization for every 0.1K of uh, temperature change, right? So if normally you operate at 1.35, and for other reasons, you're operating at 1.55K, it decreases your overall achievable polarization by 20%, which essentially gives you a 20% worse experiment for all other things being, being equal. So, you know, when you do start to, to use the, the hypersense or even the spin lab systems routinely, um, always make sure to check that polarizer temperature when, when running an experiment. Um, if it is elevated, that implies there's a problem somewhere else in there. It's not only will, does the system have a problem, it means that you're going to have uh, not as good data as you, as you could have. So it's one thing to, to keep an eye, eye on and be cognizant of. So just briefly, um, talking a little bit about the radical, the unpaired electron, there's a whole range of these compounds that you can use to transfer the polarization. Um, typically we'll use this so-called narrow line width radical, this, this tridal or OX63. Um, the others have different benefits when you're looking at either protons to, to polarize your different fields or different effects. Um, and your choice of solvent may sort of determine which radicals can be used. Some are hydrophobic, some are hydrophilic, but just kind of want to introduce you to the idea that not all unpaired electrons are created equally here. Um, it's really, you can kind of, again, go down the rabbit hole with this type of chemistry. But to keep it simple, you know, narrow line with radicals like triadyl that we use are most effective for low gamma nuclei like, like C13. Um, and the radical concentration, like we talked about, can also influence polarization. Too low, you're not able to transfer it efficiently. Too high, you can have this so-called bleaching effect where para paramagnetic effects reduce the overall polarization. Um, and this leads to this trade-off between your faster buildup time and increased sort of nuclear relaxation. So the more you put in, 
the faster it can build up, but it does have an effect on your nuclear T1. So there is a little bit of an interplay or sort of optimization for how you determine how much radical to put in. Again, something that Dave will talk about a little bit more in, in his lecture. So that's kind of the, the quick and very, very quick overview of, of DMP physics. I'm going to move over to the, the, the hardware side of things now in the remaining 20, 25 minutes or so. Are there any kind of remaining questions about sort of the, the DMP physics, why we polarize, how we do it, things to look for, pros and cons, any of that? Jeremy, do you know? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say it's a lot to take in. So it's, um, it, it's, you kind of can't do it in a half a lecture. So I tried, but there are further reading at the end if you're more curious. So I, I have a question on the, uh, actually on the, on the, the microwave source. Um, I'm wondering, well, first of all, like for the, for the hypersense, I guess you're going to get into that. Like what's the, what's the, what's the sort of the frequency bandwidth on the microwave source? And then, how does that, do you know how that affects like the polarization processes and things like that? You mean when you're like, let's say when we say we're going to irradiate it like 94 gigahertz, it's 94 plus, plus or minus. minus. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know off the top of my head how narrow band that source is. Um, I know there has been research into doing, I can't think of the word right now, but they kind of like sort of sweep that microwave frequency mm -hmm. when they do the polarization and it has been shown to provide some further increase in your, your, your buildup. Um, but no, I don't know off the top of my head what the bandwidth is of those sources. So, okay. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the polarizer hardware that we have in, in the lab. And the hypersense, the preclinical ones will go see a hands-on demo um, after this lecture. So the hypersense polarizers, these are the, the preclinical systems that we have in the high field lab. These operate at um, 3.35 Tesla and in, in relatively cold 1.4 K temperatures. These are designed for, for small samples. So anywhere from five to on the high end, probably 300 microliters you could put into the system and the output is between four and 10 mils. So anywhere from sort of cell studies to so rad studies can be supported really well by a system like this. So you have a number of key components sort of seen in this sort of cross-sectional schematic here. The first obviously is, is a magnet, that's the 3.35T. Um, the vacuum pump here is what we use to get down to 1.4K. So we fill the insert with liquid helium, that's a liquid at 4.2K, and then pump vacuum on it to get down to to colder temperatures of around 1.4 K. So that's kind of that pumping or, or sort of background noise that you'll hear when you use a hypersense system. And then the other key source is this um, microwave source seen here that, that Dave just brought up that irradiates the, um, at 94 or so gigahertz, and that's what facilitates the transfer of polarization. And then finally, we have this dissolution stick, which is really kind of the, the crucial step in this process, right? So it's all well and good if you have your hyperpolarized sample at 20, 30, 40% polarization, but if it's at 1.4 Kelvin and it's a solid, it's not gonna do you much good for anything other than sort of solid state proof of concept experiments. And so the key step here is this so-called rapid dissolution whereby the sample is brought out of the liquid helium bath and then rapidly thawed with a superheated solution. And so basically you, you wash superheated water with your neutralizing compound. So, so base and buffer in the case of pyruvic acid to rapidly dissolve and neutralize your compound. And that's the key step here. You want to minimize the time it takes to transition from a solid to a liquid. So this dissolution step is really the, the key in bringing this technology from a sort of proof of concept solid state physics to uh, uh, biochemical applications. So how it works in practice is we take our carbon enriched compound, oftentimes C13 pyruvate. We add a small amount of stable um, unpaired electron, typically this, this trital radical at around 15 millimolar. We'll pressurize the sample space, we'll load the sample 
and then we'll cool to 1.4 Kelvin, and then we irradiate with, with microwaves at that 93, 94 gigahertz range to facilitate the transfer of, of polarization. So we, we put the sample um, in the magnet, we have a very low amount of polarization, we irradiate with microwaves, and after 60 or so minutes, we now have most of the spins in the low energy state, we now have our high solid state polarization. So again, the dissolution process is really key here. So how does it work? Um, we load our neutralization media here. So it's typically water with base and buffer and a bit of EDTA to chelate any metal ions. We heat this up to high temperature and pressure. It's around 10 bar and I think 170 degrees Celsius or so. Once it hits that temperature, we pressurize the sample space. So when we open to the environment, we don't pull room air in, we evacuate helium out. We bring the sample out of the liquid helium. The stick is rapidly lowered. And then we basically open a valve, the hot water comes in, it melts your sample. And out of the output tube, you have your liquid state sample that should retain high polarization. And if you've done it right, should be at physiologic temperature, so in the 30 degrees Celsius range, as well as physiologic pH, so it's able to be rapidly injected. So there are a couple things that I wanna just go over um, to keep in mind when you do these type of experiments. So one thing that's important is you always wanna check the, the helium gas tank, right? And this is used to pressurize the sample space and also used as chase gas to clear the lines after a dissolution. So you always wanna make sure that you have sufficient helium gas on hand. If you don't, you won't be able to really run your experiment and you won't be able to have that positive pressure in the sample space. If you don't have that, you'll pull air in, it'll freeze inside that insert and the system will be down for a few days while that's repaired. So you always wanna make sure you have enough helium on hand. It's always also important to check your, your solid state buildup. That's sort of a quick um, sanity check, a good metric to, to keep an eye on. So if you're running an experiment and you have no solid state signal, that is if your signal over time is, is flat or just noise, what are some causes of that or potential causes of that? You don't have any signal at all over time. What could be the problem? I don't guess at once. So yeah, maybe the sample cup fell off when you were trying to load, um, or maybe it kind of fell off in there and didn't get all the way down to the sample space. So that would be bad if there's no cup and the cup's not in the right spot. When you do your dissolution, instead of flushing the liquid out, you flush all that liquid into a 1.4 Kelvin sample space. So it'll all freeze, you're gonna have a bad time. Um, what other problems might you have? So let's say you've, you've checked and you're 100% you're sure that that cup is in the polarizer and in the right spot. What else would cause you to have no solid state signal? Is there like, a, like no, the magnet's not turned on or the refrigerator's not turned on or... Well, the magnet, so, so yeah, if, if the magnet was not turned on, AKA quenched, then, <laughs> then yes, that would also be a problem. I would argue that's a... Not what I was thinking, but that's true. <laughs> if you have no magnet, you have no way to polarize. So yes, you always wanna make sure that's on. Um, but, but in that, so like- The microwave's broken. Yeah, so if the microwaves are at the wrong frequency, or if the microwave source isn't working, you're not gonna have any polarization buildup, right? And also maybe on the, the NMR side, maybe that, that polarimeter that's used to measure the solid state NMR signal might not be working, right? So there are a number of, sort of different parts of this chain that can cause you to have no solid state signal. Some of those problems mean you have no polarization. Some mean you have no way to monitor that polarization. But it's important to kind of, if you don't see any signal or any buildup on your experiments, it's important not to just ignore it because <laughs> ultimately it means something has gone probably sideways and it's something you want to address. So sample not present, that's a big problem. Microwave's not on, also a big problem. And the polarimeter not working means you have no way to monitor your buildup. 
interject just really quickly. Yeah. Um, one of the things with sample not present, one of the one of the problems with these polarizers is that when samples are spilled inside, which is something that we try to avoid, um, it's very difficult to get it out entirely, which means that, in fact, I think both of the polarizers in the NMR lab, they do have spilled pyruvate inside, which means that there is a back, is there's what we call the background buildup, just basically pyruvate that's stuck in there and is not inside your cup. Um, so in the case of sample not present, you would expect to see, you'd see a buildup. Um, but it is important to have a sense of what the what the background what the background profile is, which is usually done at the pyruvate frequency. That's something that like, we do maybe on a monthly basis, or other users might record in notebooks. So just something to be aware of. Um, just because you see some buildup doesn't necessarily mean that your sample is there. So always pay attention to those numbers and verify that you're getting the buildup that you anticipate. So the number you're seeing the amplitude of the buildup. Correct. So yeah, yeah, that's that's the big one. But also the build-up time constant can also be very helpful. If it's building up at you know, as quickly as pyruvate and you expect it to take three times longer, that could be a good sign that you're not actually seeing your sample build up, you're seeing the, the spilled pyruvate building up inside the polarizer. So so yeah, it's important to be, be vigilant for all these things. Good point. Yeah. So on a on a similar line, right? So what would you do if you had a sample that you had that characterized you know well, but you have lower than expected solid state signal? What are some potential causes of that? So essentially, you have lower solid state signal, or maybe lower polarization. Background signal. So yeah. So there could be background <laughs> signal in there. Nothing in your cup. That's certainly true. What are other potential routes here? Things that could have happened. Yeah, so maybe if there's too much radical in there, it'll build up faster, but then plateau to a lower polarization. That's certainly a potential. So those are all options. You know, if you spilled your sample or it didn't have the right volume in there, like if you wanted to do 24 microliters of pyruvate and only put 12 in, that would give you a lower overall signal. But also, too, you could have a wrong microwave frequency, right? That will determine your sort of optimal or your maximum polarization. So again, you always want to check that your frequency is right, that you put in the right amount of volume in there. Then also, too, you always want to check the temperature, right? Like we talked about, increased temperature gives you reduced polarization, um, which, again, all things being equal, just hamstrings you and, and, and hurts your overall experimental data, data quality. And so if you have elevated temperature, this is typically fixed with what's called a, a bake-out, which is what we're running right now, actually, in one of the, the preclinical systems. But it's designed to heat the insert in a controlled manner to remove any contaminants from the, the helium bath. And in doing so, usually it, it allows us to remove the grime and other samples that get in there, allows us to get back down to um, the cryogenic 1.35, 1.3K temperatures we, we typically operate at. Okay, got about yeah, 10 or so minutes left, so I'll, I'll try and get through the spin lab polarizer section. So we have two um, the so-called spin lab polarizers. These are designed for larger samples and for, for clinical, clinical use. We have two of them. One operates at the same field strength as the hypersense, but lower temperature, 0.8K. Then we have one that we reserve for, for clinical use. It's higher field and also 0.8K. But this can routinely achieve roughly 45 or so percent um, solid state polarization per, per 1C13 pyruvate. And these systems are designed for, for larger samples. They have a larger minimum volume that you can put in because of design in the, in the paths, roughly around 50 microliters. But the upside is you have much larger samples that you can work with. You, you can get anywhere between um, one and a half milliliters in there, probably not a bit more if you wanted to push it. Um, and same thing with output volume. Typically the lowest will go is around 10 to 12 mils, but on the high end you can get 45 plus mils of, of solution out. So definitely overkill for a mouse or a rat, but thinking for clinical translation, that's the ballpark of what, what you would inject into a patient. So what are some obvious differences between the, the hypersense and the spin lab? 
you have a feel, can you see any kind of big difference between this system and what you either saw on that hypersense photo or what your experience has been with the hypersense systems? Two big differences that you can see off the bat is that the, the spin lab systems are capable of polarizing many samples at once. So hypersense, you put something in a cup, you load it, it's one sample at a time at your throughput. Spin lab systems can polarize up to four samples simultaneously, albeit at the same microwave frequency. So there you can polarize multiple samples at once and you can do dissolutions back to back to back. Right? So you're able to, to rapidly get get your results for your DMP experiments. And the other thing too is there's no obvious way to get your sample out. At the hypersense, we have this dissolution stick that kind of goes down and grabs the sample, retrieves it, and does the dissolution. That's not here. There's no obvious sort of vertical rod coming out. We'll talk a bit about how that works in, process, in practice. So we talked about basically the main difference is you can do four samples at once. And again, the sample space is not pressurized. And it's kind of a subtle difference, but a big difference. But what that means is for the hypersense, when you do a dissolution, you pressurize the sample space. So you put helium gas in. So when you open it to the environment, you have positive pressure coming out. So air won't get sucked in. Here, the sample space is not pressurized. We don't do that. So we have to have another way to retrieve the sample, which we'll talk about in a few slides. What that means though, is that the system doesn't have any sort of helium boil off or cryogen use. You know, with the hypersense, you typically use around 1% or one liter of um, helium per, per dissolution, primarily because when you open it, the helium boils off. Here it's a closed system. So once you sort of charge the system with, with helium gas and liquid helium, you don't lose it when you do a dissolution. You're able to kind of recapture it in this 12 hour on, 12 hour off, off cycle. So you don't have to worry about filling cryogens once every month or so, or have to worry about um, low cryogen levels on a system like this. So the key components here are, again, the magnet and the microwave source. There is no vacuum pump in that same, same manner. And the, the, the key part here is you have what's so-called this absorption pump. And that's what allows us to recover the helium in this closed system. So we have a 12-hour on, 12-hour off cycle where in the nighttime undergoes what's called a, a regeneration process where it liquefies the helium that has, has boiled off. It recondenses, which we can use for the next day. So we talked about the sample space here isn't pressurized for, for dissolution. So while that minimizes cryogen consumption to, to zero cryogen use, um, we have no dissolution stick. So if we don't have a dissolution stick, how do you get the sample out? I mean, even how do you even load the sample, right? That's sort of the, the big design difference and process between the preclinical and clinical system. So what we use is the so-called fluid paths for both preclinical and, and clinical applications. So the schematic is here and sort of a um, photo. Is, is shown down here. And so you can think of it as being uh, an integrated um, dissolution stick and solvent vessel. So your sample vial here is effectively your, the equivalent of your sample cup on the hypersense. The so-called dynamic seal here is that sample port. That separates the, the vacuum of the magnet from the, the atmosphere and the air outside. This sort of Coaxial tubing here is your dissolution line. So the way the dissolution works is you have your superheated solvent in the so-called so-called dissolution syringe here. When you do your dissolution, you have this coaxial tubing. So on the inner line, the liquid goes in, melts the sample in the sample cup, and returns on the outside line here, and then it goes to a receiving flask, a receiving vessel, that you then use for your dissolution. And because this is all in an integrated um, fluid path, you don't need to pressurize that sample space. And that's why you can get away with not having to have any sort of external dissolution stick. So, this, so the, the system in practice is never opened to the atmosphere. So you never lose that helium gas. So 
Sample prep, it is a little more time consuming than the hypersense. With the hypersense, you put your sample in a cup, you put it on the stick, you load it, you lower it, you're done in about 30 seconds. For the spin lab, it is a little more um, time consuming. You have to load the sample in the vial. You then have to, to sort of glue or combine that vial to the, the plastic lumen here. You then have to put your dissolution media in the syringe. You've got to pressurize. And you do this pressure test for your fluid path to make sure you have no air in the line that would cause blockages. You have to try it to remove residual moisture. You load the sample and then you can, you can dissolute. So it takes more time to prep on the front end because you can polarize multiple samples simultaneously. You can usually recoup that on the back end. So running out of time, so I'll, I'll kind of finish with some, some key considerations here before we go over to the, the high field lab for our experiments. So many of the talking points we had for the hypersense are still pertinent here, right? You always wanna check your solid state buildup. If that's off from what it typically has been, that's a problem needs to be addressed. Always wanna check your temperature. If that's elevated, you're gonna have lower polarization and, and worse data. Um, central to the spin lab um, is this fluid path. So you do need to inspect it prior to loading. You know, if you have any liquid that gets in the fluid path, that can lead to an ice blockage, your dissolution will fail. If you don't have um, a good glue connection between the sample vial and the lumen, the vial can fall off during dissolution. So again, all of that liquid goes into your helium bath, that all um, evaporates, you've got a bad time. Um, but also, too, you need, you need an output tube, you need a way to, to collect your polarized solution. If you don't have that, you have no way to retrieve your sample from the spin lab. So this slide here is, is sort of the, the macro high-level takeaway from the difference between the hypersense and the spin lab. Hypersense is designed for, for small samples. Um, it does consume cryogens, and it does build up faster at lower polarization. Um, the spin lab, in contrast, is designed for, for larger volumes. It does take longer to prep the samples, but it is cryogen free, and you do achieve higher polarization. So those are the, the main differences between the preclinical and, and clinical systems. So with that, I'll kind of skip the, the final few slides on how this works clinically. I'll talk a little, little bit about it in my imaging lecture. Um, before we head over to the lab, are there any questions about um, the polarizer hardware or hypersense spin lab, the differences, anything like that? Can the spin lab tell you the polarization of each individual sample? Yeah, so it, it can. The way it works is you have one large sort of NMR pickup coil in there and you have up to four samples. So when you have more than one, it does a subtraction based method. So it'll measure the signal from all, let's say if you have two samples in there, it'll measure the, the signal from two samples. It'll bring one up, so out of the magnet, oh. or out of the, the coil, do a measurement, then do a subtraction, right? And that's how you get information on each individual channel and each individual sample. Anything else? Yeah, so in the spin lab, it does use cryogens because it's able to keep the helium in there with the uh, charcoal system. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know we do still fill the helium, so how, how much does it retain? Like, like what's like the rate of decay for the like, helium in the system? In the spin lab? Yeah. So in principle, it, it, it's a completely closed system. So you need a little bit of helium gas to, to sort of pressurize the dissolution syringe, but in terms of the, the helium in the system, so both in, in the sorb and in the insert, that is in principle a, a, a closed loop, oh. so you don't lose any there. So okay. that, that, that should be able to run indefinitely as long as that cold head is still on. All right, so I'll put these slides online. Um, I'm happy to come talk if you guys have any more questions about the physics or the hardware, and I'll leave you in days or any capable things. Now, is the plan to split the group in half? Uh, so are we like half spin lab, half uh